Hi, I'm Susie Larson. Thank you for listening to Susie Larson Live. Faith Radio podcasts are only possible because of your support. So thanks for giving, and thanks for sharing with a friend. It's only just a matter of... Welcome to Susie Larson Live. Always so honored to get to spend this time with you. In fact, I look forward to bringing you conversations every single day that hopefully inspire you in your faith walk, that deepen your understanding of God's Word, and that heightens your awareness of His very real presence in your life. I hadn't planned on doing this show. In fact, I came down to my studio after hours because I just felt like the Lord was prompting me to put the show together. I have all these thoughts in my heart and in my mind that I want to convey. And quite honestly, I don't know if I can. I don't know if I'm able to say um, what's all jumbled up in my heart and mind, but I felt so strongly that the Lord wanted me to make my best effort. I want to talk with you about all of these Christian leaders that are publicly falling. And for every one that you hear about in the news, there are private Christians who aren't in the public sphere who are also falling out of the race or being exposed. Things are coming to light. I'm not one to call people out online or on the air. And I'm not going to really do that here. I mean, you just read your news, your Christian news. You're going to know one after the other after the other. But the most recent story involved a criminal act that was covered up. I'm so grieved I don't even know what to say. I've spent time with the Lord just weeping, apologizing to him for us, his bride. Lord, I don't even know what to say. I just feel so sad for the shape of the church. And yet, and yet, for every one that falls, there are thousands and thousands who are grinding it out, staying the course, loving in a way that costs them. In fact, the truth of the matter is the church is alive and well, and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. Jesus is coming for a spotless bride. He's the one who cleanses us, redeems us, restores us. Even so, when I hear these stories, it's so sobering. You know, there but for the grace of God go any of us. You know the old hymn? prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. I'll take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. I think it's so important to pay attention to the slightest deviations within us. That's why David just, he knew his heart so well. You know, he messed up a lot, and yet God called him a man after God's own heart because he prayed prayers like this, we find in Psalm 139. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me in your everlasting way. Friend, I think we need to be praying that on a regular basis. Because in the day when the love of most has grown cold, you have lots of opportunities to react, to get bitter, to make choices you otherwise wouldn't. Boy, to keep short accounts with our departures. Another prayer the psalmist prays is keep me back from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I'll be innocent and blameless of great transgression. What's a presumptuous sin? Well, we presume just because God is good to us, he's good with everything we do, and he's not. And you see that played out over and over again in the Old Testament with the Israelites. He was good to them. He was good to them. And oh, how they wandered. Oh, how they forgot. Oh, how they defied his honor. And we do the very same thing. Not that God wants us to live in condemnation. In fact, the opposite is true. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. But we've lost the fear of God. We've lost the fear of God. There needs to be a restored Reverence. I did a show. I think I titled it Return to Awe. I think if you searched for it that way, you'd find it. But, oh, Lord, bring us back to that place, that holy fire. 
Our God is a consuming fire. I remember when I was getting going in ministry, and on one hand, I knew I was called to it. But on the other hand, I had trauma in my backstory and so much insecurity, so much fear that I hadn't worked out yet. I knew still how broken I was. I was just terrified. I had a fear of exposure. You know, I and, and I had a friend who said to me, "What what's to expose? You're like one of the cleanest livers I know. We both laugh about that to this day. But and I couldn't when she asked me that, it's like it's not that I was hiding anything. I just I don't know what I was afraid of. But I was afraid that God wouldn't have my back. That's what I was afraid of. Because we're bumbling our way. We're imperfect, you know, we misstep at times. And uh that's completely different than blatant duplicit sin and acting one way and speaking and pretending that you're another. But you know what I'm saying? Like I think as an introvert and a person who bends towards privacy and probably my most consistent self-sin is self-preservation. I pull in, you know, I get small. And I remember just that fear was just relentless. In our old house, I used to sit in the sink to do my makeup. I get close to the mirror. And one of my sons one day asked, why do you, why do you sit in the sink? And I had to think for a minute. I'm like, well, because my sister always did. <laughs> she That's how she put on her mascara. That's how she did her eye makeup. So I don't know. I just developed the same habit. In our growing up house, there was two sinks side by side. There were times I would sit in one sink and she would in the other. And I sort of did what she did. So here I am, a grown woman, three kids. I'd sit in the sink and I'm putting on my makeup. And the Lord thundered in my heart. I was getting ready to go to a speaking event. I actually wasn't in bad shape at that moment, but that prevailing fear kept surfacing at different times. And I would feel raw and vulnerable and exposed and scared. And, you know, it's like on one hand, God, I want to believe you for great things. But on the other hand, I need to trust you that where you guide, you provide. But in this moment, I was sitting in the sink, had worship music on. I was doing okay, getting ready for an event. And the Lord's voice thundered in my spirit with so much clarity. He said, Susie, I expose the wicked. I defend, deliver, and protect the righteous, not because you're perfect, but because you are mine and you are mine. And I literally gasped and went, what? And I heard it again. I expose the wicked, but I defend and deliver and protect the righteous not because they're perfect, but because they're mine and you are mine. I wept. I sobbed. I couldn't believe how deep that fear went. I tried to put my makeup on and I cried it off again and I put it on again and I cried it off again and I just thought, whatever, forget about it. And I went down and my husband was having his time in the in the front little living room and I crawled in his lap and just cried and said, you're not going to believe what God just said to me. That was a huge turning point for me in ministry to trust God has my back. But a presumptuous sin would be to say, I can live however I want, and I can declare the passage, no weapon formed against me will prosper. Well, it's not true. You know, you think about Joshua, the Lord said, do not fear, you know, be strong, be courageous. I'm the Lord, your God, I'm with you wherever you go. And a little bit down the road, Joshua sees somebody, it turns out to be an angel with a sword. And he kind of stands at attention and says, are you friend or foe? He says, neither. I'm a commander of the angels of the Lord's army. Take off your shoes. This is holy ground. Joshua had a moment there where he realized, though God is for him, he needed to search his heart to say, am I for God? And the reason that this angel, even though God had just said, I am for you, I am with you, was this angel contradicting God? Absolutely not. The angel was in his path for him to not presume anything. And what it turned out was that some of the Israelites had idols in their tents that would cause them to lose a future battle going up against their enemies. And I think these moments when you are you come to grips with somebody's failures, it should stop us in our tracks. To the point where we say, okay, I know God, I know you're for me, but am I for you? Are there presumptuous sins in my life? Am I taking you for granted? I remember our, he's a retired pastor now, but he was our pastor for many years. And he talked about a time when he was a youth pastor 
And the Lord had told him, prayer needs to be the centerpiece of everything you do. Don't make a move without consulting me. And that's biblical. Jesus didn't make a move without consulting the Father. He did everything the Father told him. He and the Father were one. Well, there was one time this pastor got really busy, and uh, he had his youth group on the bus, if I remember right, and they got going without praying. And if I think they ended up in the ditch. They had some kind of accident. And the Lord's conviction went so deep that he profoundly and deeply repented because he presumed upon God. We're not supposed to be scared of God, but we are to fear him. When you walk in the fear of God, that is just the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When we walk in a reverent fear of the Lord, we can say, as the scripture says, no weapon formed against me will prosper. And every tongue that rises up against me will be proven false. This is the heritage of the saints, and those who belong to him. Our righteousness comes from him. When you walk as a citizen of heaven, when you walk in the fear of the Lord, it's very similar to what I heard the Lord say that day. I defend you and deliver you, not because you're perfect, but because you're mine. He will defend and deliver us. Nobody can testify against us in a way that condemns us to hell because Jesus has died for us. But to walk in the assurance of God's protection is to walk in the fear of who he is and the honor of who he is. So what I want to do in this show today is just outline some things that I feel like God has been speaking to me about kind of as a reset. What can I do? so that I can stand strong and finish well. And that first one is to fear the Lord. Fear God. Honor Him. Again, not be afraid of Him, like He's an abusive father, but to rightly honor Him. To fear God is to say, Lord, I'm going to do what you say, because I know you're going to do what you say. To fear God is to dare to ask Him to search your heart. To fear God is to pay attention to the convicting work of the Holy Spirit within. When you even get a grudge against someone, when you're short with someone, when you judge someone or gossip about someone, when you eat more than you should or drink more than you should or spend more than you should, and the Spirit of God gives you that inner wince, the fear of God would have you repent and respond and then rise up in the grace and the mercy and the goodness of God. That is the beauty of belonging to God. We get to repent, to be cleansed, and to be reestablished. What a, what a mighty God we serve. I'll be back in just a moment. You know one of the greatest barriers to thriving in life, one of the greatest barriers to an intimate walk with God, is unforgiveness. It blocks our view of the sun. It keeps us from hearing God's voice. It ties us up in knots and holds us captive. It's hard, but we're called to it, to forgive. People are going to hurt us, but God misses nothing. When it comes to your story and your life, he's indifferent about nothing. And one day, he'll make all things right. So by forgiving doesn't mean what they did is okay. By forgiving, it means you're rolling your burden onto the shoulders of the Lord who can actually do something about it. And it frees you up to live free, pure, healed, and whole. If you need some help with forgiving, you can text the word forgive to 877-933-2484. You'll receive a series of text messages featuring audio clips of interviews from our shows, Mornings with Carmen, my show, Suzy Larson Live, and my friend, Bill Arnold, Afternoons with Bill. These texts will highlight past shows, Bible verses, and encouraging words and prayers to help you move forward in your journey of forgiveness. Don't miss it, friend. Forgiveness will help set you free. Text the word forgive today to 877-933-2484. Welcome back to Suzy Larson Live. Uh, this is a different kind of show. Uh, one I hadn't planned on recording, but as I lamented and prayed, um, I felt the Lord just keep nudging me, get down in your studio and record this show. So here I am, and uh, 
If you just tuned in once the live show's over, maybe you can go here at the beginning. But I'm recording today's show. It's all about standing strong and finishing well. But it's in light of recent events of key leaders um, committing sins um, and duplicit actions um, that are heart-wrenching. And they've been going on. It's been going on for a long time. But I would say in the more recent history, it's one after another after another. And I just found myself weeping before God, just apologizing to him for how the collateral damage, the loss of trust. But then he did remind me that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The church is alive and well. And for every person you see fall publicly, and even those we don't hear about privately, there are millions of Christians who are living sacrificially, who love when it costs them, who give in ways they feel, who pray in ways that shakes heaven and earth. There are lots of serious Christians on the earth today. And if we just focus on the stains and the spots, um, we're going to get discouraged. But he's coming back for a bride without spot, without wrinkle, and he's purifying his bride. But it is a time for us to take our walk seriously. It is time for us to respond to the cleansing work of the Holy Spirit. And so I just wrote down a list of of a handful of ways for me. These are just me working out my faith. They're things I apply myself to. As I started to pray about, Lord, what, what can I even up my game in? Or what? Show me, Lord, just wisdom and strategy to stand strong in this day and to finish well. As I said at the open of the show, that old hymn, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for the courts above. Scripture says, all have sinned. Each turns to his own way. So the truth is, everybody has a sinful bent. Some are more obvious than others, but every single person has a sinful bent. And Paul talked about the nature of the sinful nature, the flesh and the spirit at war with one another, tugging back and forth. He says, a mindset on the flesh is death. A mindset on the spirit is life and peace. I think we're in the middle of birth pains. We are so in at least the beginning of the end. And whether Jesus comes in a few days, a few weeks, or a hundred years, it's our time that we're living in. And the birth pangs are picking up. Moral depravity, apostasy, the shame. Our shame has become our glory. People are calling evil good and good evil. That's the day we live in. So we can blend like chameleons and talk a good talk. If we do that, there'll be no power in our Christian life. Scripture says the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. If we want anointing in our life, we have to fear God. If we want power in our life, we have to obey him. And I do believe that Christians can go a long time on gifting because God gives his children gifts. He he operates through us, and he operates through us because he loves people so much. So does that negate some of the ministry people received from these leaders who have fallen? It doesn't. It is amazing. God works through broken, broken people. But the thing is, we're all accountable before God, and we're going to have to give an account someday. So now's the time to get right with God. If there's a duplicit way in you, if you're pretending to be better than you are, get real with God. Search your heart. Ask the Spirit of God to search your heart. So one of the things that I just really believe is foundational to standing strong and finishing well is just returning to the fear of the Lord. I mean, truly, how about you even just stop before you pray and remember who it is you're talking to? Stop before you pray and remember the one who put the stars in place knows my name. He knows about every hair on my head. He knows about every wicked, selfish thought and every generous gesture. He knows me and he loves me and he wants a relationship with me. God of wonder. He merely spoke, and the heavens came to be. Christian Stanfield was in town recently. He and the 
passion group for a media conference that we had internally at our company and at Northwestern Media. And he said from the stage, we are just noticing songs of heaven are the ones that are reverberating on the earth right now. And it's just really true. Songs that speak, he is to come. You know, he who is to come. Wow. I mean, think about it. If you can find some songs that bring heaven to earth, that really put you in touch with the awesomeness of God, the majesty of Almighty God, listen to those songs and open your hands and be honest with God. I strongly suggest Psalm 103. It's this beautiful progression of the things God does for us, forgives all our sins, heals all our diseases, ransoms my life from the pit, crowns me with loving compassion, satisfies my desires with good things, and my youth is renewed like the eagles. First, he tells you, the scripture tells you what he does, but then it goes on to tell you who he is and what he's like. Spend some time in Psalm 103 and meditate. But if you return to the fear of God, he will bring revelation to your soul. He will tell you things you do not know. Why? Because scripture says he confides in those who fear him. Return to the fear of the Lord. Second, I would say, return to fasting and prayer if you're not already. I saw a meme the other day on Instagram. Francis Chan said, the Western church has sadly traded fasting and prayer for talent. Whoa. I think that's true. We celebrate talent and polished performances. But you know where the anointing is? You know where the true life change is happening? It's through the saint who spends time in private prayer. And you know what Jesus talked about? When you pray, pray in private. Don't do it for a big show. Get with me. Get alone with me. And he says, and the one who sees you in private will reward you publicly when you pray. He also says, when you give, this is how you should give. When you pray, when you give. And when you fast, Jesus basically declared, as followers of mine, you will pray, you will fast, you will give, because that's in the DNA. That's what Jesus did. But I'm just telling you, when people take seriously the call of God on their life in the private world, when how you walk privately matters even more than how you walk publicly, there will be an increased power and anointing on your life. God will start to speak to you because you become a trusted vessel. So if, if you find yourself putting more emphasis and weight on talent in front of you and even the talent within you, but it's been a while since you've created some time and space to fast and pray, return to fasting and pray. There, I had a guest on, I don't know, about a year ago, but Kevin and I have gone through this book. It's called Fasting with God, Finding Breakthrough and Power in the Names of God. Tammy Hotzenpeller. It's a 21-day little prayer guide. It's a thick book, but it really is just simple, short readings each day where you focus on the name of God, a particular name of God, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh. And as you're fasting for a breakthrough, you're focusing on the name of God. I highly recommend that you engage in a fast if it's been a while. Dr. Jack Hayford is someone I, I deeply respect, and I, he's in heaven now, and I can't wait to sit down and have a talk with him. I feel like I might have had him on the show maybe 10, 11, 12 years ago. I'm almost positive, but I don't remember for sure. But I've loved his work, his books that I've read, and I heard this about him that he loved chocolate. But because he loved chocolate, not to be legalistic, but because he feared God, he decided to fast chocolate for his life. He just decided to not eat chocolate because he wanted to say no to his flesh. And if you've listened to my show for any length of time, you've heard me say that I believe that we have to say no to our flesh and make our flesh deal with it on a regular basis. I did that with my boys when they were growing up. I would put them on partial fast with toys that were becoming too important. I'd make sure to tell them, this isn't punitive. This isn't punishment. You're not in trouble. But that thing's getting to be too important to you. And nothing should have that much power in your life. Nothing but God. And when they would set it aside for a week, the freedom that would happen in their lives after they went through withdrawals, when they get the toy back, it just didn't mean as much anymore. Fasting positions you to be 
into a deeper place of dependence on God. Fasting puts you into a deeper dependence on God. So ask the Lord, what should I give up? I'm prayerfully considering just living a fasted lifestyle. I mean, I kind of do with my dietary issues, but there's just some things, you know, party foods, snacks, and sweets. I'm seriously considering giving those up. You know, when I do 21-day fast, I give them up except one day a week. I let myself have a little chips and guac and uh, a sweet treat. I'm thinking of making that a way of life because I feel so sober right now about the times we're in. And the amplified version of 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says this, do you know that in a race, all the runners run their very best to win, but only one receives a prize? Run your race in such a way that you may seize the prize and make it yours. Now, every athlete who goes into training and competes in the games is disciplined and exercises self-control in all things. They do it to win a crown that withers, but we do it. So we do it, friends. We do it to receive an imperishable crown that cannot wither. Therefore, I do not run without a definite goal. I do not flail around like one beating the air, just shadow boxing. But like a boxer, I strictly discipline my body and make it my slave. So that after I have preached the gospel to others, I myself will not somehow be disqualified as unfit for service. Another translation says, I buffet my body. I make it my slave. Because I fear that after preaching to others, I myself will fall out of the race. There's something very connected to saying no to our flesh in controlled kind of smaller ways and obviously in big ways, but for sure to start in our private world, things that are not sin in themselves. Remember what the scripture says, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and run the race marked out before you. Fix your eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross and scorning it, he scorned its shame. Then he sat down at the right hand of the Father. The passage goes on to say, so consider him who endured such sin from sin, scorn from sinful men that you don't grow weary and lose heart. I think it's so important to buffet our bodies. I think it's so important to fast and pray. You can take or leave this advice, but it's stuff that I do and I'm pondering about how I can do this on a deeper level. I got to finish well. More than anything in the world, I want to finish well. I want to live a life worthy of Jesus. All he paid, all he endured, he did for love. I'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to Suzy Larson Live. So honored to have you listening today. I hadn't planned on doing this show, but felt prompted by God to hop in my studio and record this one. It was just bursting in my heart, and it's about standing strong and finishing well, especially in light of the news of very public Christian leaders falling one by one. And um, know this, though, for everyone that's fallen or admitted to a duplicit life, There are thousands of faithful saints literally grinding it out day after day, loving and serving and giving and praying in a way that honors God and helps others. And I want to remind you, I'm saying this in every segment, the church is alive and well, and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. But there is a shaking going on. And it is true, that's what's hidden will come to light. And it should really put a fear of God in us because he sees all, and he will come for a spotless bride. He wants us to walk purely before him. It's the pure in heart that see God. So I'm just talking about some of the things that I'm, that I do uh, to sort of shore up my life, but I, I've just felt so sober, so brokenhearted. I, I don't know. I just, I'm like, Lord, help me to honor you in all that I do. Help us to finish strong. And so I started with talking about the fear of the Lord. And again, if you just tuned in, go back and catch the podcast once the live show's over. Also talked about fasting and prayer, making room 
for a deeper intimacy with God in fasting and prayer. Where walking with God and your intimacy with Him just becomes the most important thing about you. And I've touched on that. I just want to expound a little bit more, if I could. I wrote about this in my book, Your Sacred Yes. This was an older book of mine, but it's packed with, I would say, 15 years of fruitful wisdom. Um, We were headed towards burnout. I remember it like it was yesterday. And there was a woman in our church um, who reached out to see if we could get together. And she, I thought she just wanted to get to know me. And we sat across each other at the restaurant. But what she had to say to me about knocked me silly. She leaned across the table with purposefulness. and She proceeded to tell me her story, how she and her husband once served invisible leadership roles, like my hubby and me, how people honored and respected them for all their contributions, again, like us. Pause here. Kevin and I were doing way more than God asked of us, and we were running hard towards burnout, and we weren't doing that well. She explained they were in a similar place. They were honored. They were serving a lot. And how, for a season, all that activity did bear lots of fruit, like us, it seemed. But then one day it happened. In a moment of sheer exhaustion and unrealized vulnerability, her husband lost his footing, tripped up morally, and everything came crashing down around them. At the time that she and I met, they were still sorting through the wreckage trying to put their life back together. She leaned in a little bit closer, said, Susie, I'm quite sure that neither Kev nor you have any thoughts or secret desires to step off of God's path for you, but I see that weariness in your eyes. And I know we have a fierce opponent who is our enemy, and he's going to wait for just the right time to trip you or Kevin up. He intends to take you out. God has put you on my heart time and time again, and I'm telling you, warning you, please step back. Get some rest, reset, put some firmer boundaries around your marriage, your life, and your time. That breakfast date put a healthy fear of God in me. I believe it's entirely possible she saved us, or rather God saved us through her and her boldness and obedience from some kind of devastation. And I thank God for her courage. Kev and I were racing toward burnout. And that encounter was one of the many catalysts God used to slow us down and put us back on track. Since that time, we have maintained, and that was almost 20 years ago, I think, we've maintained certain boundaries around marriage and ministry. In a day where women speakers are all over the country and their husbands are at home, we just decided we either go together or we stay home together. I'm not leaving without him. I can't. I can't do it. And so that may mean we say no more often than not, but we just feel like that's important. Our morning prayer times are non-negotiable, and we've got some other boundaries as well. But I want to be wise enough to listen to the messages God sends my way and make the necessary course adjustments. And there might be someone you are deeply burdened about. Pray about how to sit down with them. Pray that their hearts will be prepared. Proverbs twenty-seven twelve says, The prudent see danger and take refuge. But the simple just keep going, and they pay the penalty. I think one of the reasons fasting and praying is so important is because if we're not spending regular intimate time with God and clearing the schedule of the clutter so we can hear from God, we're going to give away too much time to things unappointed by God, and we will not have the grace to sustain them. We'll put ourselves at risk. And I will tell you, one of the things that I talk about in your sacred yes is that overcommitment not only will wear you down, it'll make you spiritually vulnerable. Around that time when I was just really exploring um, how that was true, because I was hearing back then of leaders falling, and I would sometimes get a chance to ask them after the fact what happened. Over and over again, they would say, my work with God became more important than my walk with God. My work for God became more important than my walk with God. I always say, If what we get to do for God of stages, what Jesus has done for us, we've already lost our way. It was many years ago, I decided to cover the topic of spiritual vulnerability on my show. The phones lit up, listeners called in to share their near misses and their failures and the steps they now take 
to guard their hearts. I'll never forget one particular call that came in that day. A woman who wished to remain anonymous shared how both she and her husband had been busy running parallel paths, doing life simultaneously but separately, kind of like Kevin and I were. I mean, we were together, but we were pulling at the seams. But this woman, she met a man. She choked on her words as she attempted to share the rest of her story. She said, I mistakenly believed that the burden of my obedience to God, given the current state of my marriage, would be heavier than the consequence of my sin. And she started to cry. She said, I couldn't have been more wrong. It would have been far easier to resist temptation than to face what I'm dealing with now. Tim Chester wrote this. People do not feel stress simply because they have a lot going on. Most of us enjoy doing lots of things. We only feel busy when we try to do more than we can. The problem is not expecting to do a lot, but expecting to do a little bit more than possible. So here's a foundational truth for what follows. God does not expect me to do more than I can. If God doesn't expect me to do more than I can, the key question to ask ourselves is, why am I trying to do more than I can? I think if we want to finish well, we want to stand strong and finish well, we've got to spend that time in fasting and praying and lift all of our commitments up to God and give him permission to rearrange our life. If he's asking you to pull back, it's protection. So fear of the Lord, fasting and prayer. Here's another one. Keeping your faith and your heart engaged, not just for yourself, but for others. When we go through the motions because we get so busy, we disengage our hearts. And when we disengage our hearts, we disengage our faith. You might know your way around the church, around all the worship songs, around your Bible. You may know how to talk like a Christian. But if you're seriously just going through the motions, but your heart isn't in it, nothing happens in the spiritual realm. And the enemy would love nothing more than for you to just go through the motions. But when you keep your heart in it, when you sing songs and mean it, like I am no longer a slave to fear, I am a child of God. When you pray for other people, where you enter into a suffering that's not your own. I've got a few people in my life that are sick, one specifically, I am not letting go. I'm like, I am believing God for a miracle for her. I feel it so deeply. But you know what I have to tell you? Carrying that burden, shouldering one another's burden, fulfills the law of Christ. Somehow, some way, it keeps you in the fight. And you know what else? I really believe this in all these years of walking with God. Our trials are keeping us out of trouble. You might be in hand-to-hand combat right now with trials that you just don't want to be dealing with. But I'm telling you what, those very trials, if, if you fight them correctly, when you take a firmer grip with your tired hands... You strengthen your weak knees. You mark out a straight path for your feet. You start to engage your faith for yourself and for others. It's actually making a warrior out of you. And that is actually keeping you out of trouble. Do you remember King David in springtime when the kings usually go off to war? He went up on his deck, and that's when he got in trouble. We long for a life of ease, but that's when we get in trouble. Maybe, just maybe, your trials are keeping you out of trouble. Fear God. Fast and pray and engage your faith. We'll be back in a minute. Faith Radio podcasts are produced by the listener-supported ministry of Faith Radio. If you're interested in becoming a team member, a donor to this ministry, you can support the podcast anytime and donate at myfaithradio.com. Thanks so much for tuning into Susie Larson Live. Thanks for listening to this different show today. Just felt led and prompted by God to come down to my studio and record this show about standing strong and finishing well. In light of news events recently of leaders falling, and really this has been happening off and on for years, hasn't it? But I don't know, the more recent news has rocked me. I don't need to call out names. You can read for yourself. You no doubt heard of of different stories that are heartbreaking. I have found myself with the Lord just crying, crying out to him, have mercy, O God, and help us, Lord. Live in a manner worthy of your name. 
I'm going to say this again. I've said it every segment. I'll say it again. Even though these things are happening, the church is alive and well. The church is alive and well, and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. Jesus is coming for a pure and spotless bride, and he is purifying each of us and consecrating each of us and teaching each of us how to live. But we have free will, and we can shrug our shoulders and do our own thing, or we can walk in the fear of God, but it's not without consequence. In the book of Hebrews, it says, don't make light of the Lord's discipline, and don't lose heart when he rebukes you, for the Lord disciplines those he loves. Don't make light and don't lose heart. I want you to think about that. Don't make light of it like it's nothing and don't lose heart like you're nothing. And those are two responses when we get confronted, right? We shrug it off, make excuses, it's nothing, or we fall apart and come under condemnation like we're nothing. But a healthy, maturing believer stands before the Lord and dares to say, Lord, search me. Know me, test me, try me, show me if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in your everlasting way. Keep me back from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me so I will be innocent and blameless of great transgression. So during this show, I've been talking about just things that I do, but I felt led to revisit them and kind of press in deeper, kind of up my game. But the first one is to walk in the fear of the Lord. I highly recommend John Bevere's book on the awe of God. You can go back and listen to my show with him. I think I might get him back on again to revisit this topic. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I talked a lot about fasting and prayer and about a meme I saw on Instagram by Francis Chan, who said in the Western church, we've replaced fasting and prayer with talent. God forgive us. The anointing is going to be on those who fast and pray. And all of us, need to be fasting and praying. And then I said, faith engaged. So fear of God, fasting and prayer, and keeping your faith engaged, that your trials are going to keep you out of trouble. When you shoulder one another's burden, it fulfills the law of Christ. Your faith needs to be exercised and engaged, which means you need to be living in a way that's out of your reach, that's over your head. If you're only trying to accomplish the things that you can do on your own, there's no faith muscle that's being worked, no faith that's being stretched, and you can't please God without faith. Maybe you need some bigger dreams. Maybe you need some bigger problems. Because truly, I believe it, when we're in trouble, when we're facing the storm, that's when we press in. When we're doing well, that's when we often let go. And if you are in a, in a season of rest, praise God, but use it to grow intimacy with God. Don't loosen your hold on the promises of God. You need him every bit as much in seasons of blessing as you do in seasons of burden. And to revisit David, King David, at a time when kings go to war, he retreated. He had enough success riding on his past laurels. The cascade of events and sins and crimes that that man committed because he chose ease when he should have been engaged, it's heartbreaking. Stay engaged. Now, another one is consistent confessional community. I've got a group of women that I connect with every Wednesday morning. And then the larger group, a few other women and all their husbands, we get together once uh, every other month. But the women, these four women, we start out with praise. We praise God. We start our prayer out just thanking God because you enter his gates with thanksgiving. And then we go into confession and we are honest about things. And I've confessed these things on the show before, but, you know, one of the things that came up for me, and again, I talked about it on the show, but in the stretch when I was really struggling health-wise, I realized I was buying supplements left and right. And I didn't, I wouldn't have said it. I didn't realize it till I got convicted for it that I was helping myself because I didn't feel like God was helping me. If I would pray about things in other areas of my life and he would answer what what came to my health, it was crickets. I'm like, where are you? Tell me what to do. And since he wasn't speaking, I took matters into my own hands. I wasn't that blatant. I didn't realize it, but it is what I did. And I had to repent of that. But by my repenting, another gal said, wow, 
I didn't even think about this, but you saying that, I go to food for comfort. So I think it's so important to move from coping to consecration. We have so much at our fingertips, but I think it's incredibly important to just not to be a legalist, but to notice these accommodations for our flesh. If we just shrug our shoulders like they're nothing and we're not careful, those are the ramps. Those are the on-ramps that the enemy will use to come against us. Again, everybody, we each have to walk this out in our own way. You know when you're getting legalistic. I'm not talking about that. But you also know when you're indulging in a way that's beyond what's right, you know? And uh, I've done the same thing with buying outfits for myself. I remember seeing a few outfits hanging in the closet. And I saw those price tags dangling. And I, you know, we had the money for it. We give a lot away. We tithe. We give offerings. We manage our finances. We, we're stewards. I didn't spend money I shouldn't have, that I didn't have, but I didn't need those clothes. And I realized when I looked at them, I was rocked in my core that once again, it had been such a long stretch of heartbreak for me and my health that I wanted to do something nice for myself and do something new. Now, some of you might like, what's so wrong with that? Well, maybe it wouldn't be wrong for you. But in my situation, I was hurt. I didn't realize it. But when I started to pause and pay attention, I was hurt by God. And I went and bought myself something. And so... That's just important, I think, just to pay attention. What do you do? And why do you do it? Not because of legalism, but because you love God and you want to walk intimately with him. I'm reading this book, God's Generals. I'm taking my time through it, but it's just biographies of saints of old. And at the end of one of them, it says this, I challenge you today to take account of your life, to count the cost, to analyze where you stand in the area of faithfulness. I challenge you to know what you believe in and what you are against. Listen to this. Then to stand true to those convictions. Demonstrate the cutting edge of truth to the nations of the earth and never allow yourself to be counted, listen to this, among the persecutors, the despisers, or the envious. Whatever your call on life may be, always stand true on God's side and be faithful. Don't be among those who are envy, envious and petty and jealous or doing the, being the ones who are doing the persecuting. Be the one who fears God. As I get ready to wrap here, I want to share this. I write about this in my book, Fully Alive, but it's from John Eldridge, from his book, All Things New. And this is what he writes. What would you love your reception into the kingdom to be? You should put some words to that, given how important it is. A friend of mine who labored long in the great war with evil shared his vision with me in a moment of tender vulnerability. And this is what the friend wrote to John. I want to finish well. I want to return as a hero, a warrior worthy of the kingdom. I had this vision. I don't know if it was an actual vision or just my heart's expression. I saw myself, sword at my side, shield slung over my back, making my way up the main street of the city. I wore the battle gear of war, soiled by long years at the front. People lined both sides of the street to welcome me. The great cloud, I guess. I recognized hundreds of faces, the faces of those whose freedom I fought for. Their smiles and tears filled my heart with profound joy. As I made my way up the street toward Jesus and our Father, my friends and fellow warriors stepped into the street with me, and we moved forward as a band. I saw angels there, maybe angels who fought for us and with us alongside. I saw flower petals on the pavement. I saw banners flapping in the breeze. We reached the throne, and we knelt. Jesus came forward and kissed my forehead, and we embraced deeply and freely, like I always knew we would. Then my father stepped forward and took me by the shoulders and said, Well done, my son. Very well done indeed. Welcome home. And as we embraced, a great cheer went up from the crowd. John Eldridge continues this way. Now that would be a reception worth living for. The reality that every story will be told rightly should affect your choices today. If there's no cost to our Christian faith, how then shall we be rewarded? And may I point out that if we too would love to receive a hero's welcome, it helps to keep in mind that valiant deeds require desperate times. The desperate times are all around us, friends. Now 
for the valiant deeds. End quote. So what kind of heroes welcome awaits you? Can you imagine it? How should we live? We can enjoy deep intimacy with God right now because we can. He made a way for us. We abide in his presence. We do what he says. We keep his word, especially close to our heart. We keep marching. We pray his word. We dream wild dreams with him. We take crazy faith risks. We believe. We encourage each other. We love well. We reflect his heart to the least of these. We remind one another, this is not our home. We're only passing through. But we're making this journey for a purpose, and every one of our steps counts. So you and I, we're going to urge each other onward and upward and remind ourselves that Jesus does his best work through our weaknesses. He loves your faith, and he's happily at work preparing a place for you. I think it's safe to say he's downright giddy for that day. So our hearts beat strong at the thought of the welcome and the life that awaits us. He's so worth it, isn't he? Let's live a life worthy of his name. Have a blessed day. Thanks for tuning in. I'll meet you back here next time. Thank you for listening to this conversation from Suzy Larson Live. These conversations are available because of your support. You can become a supporter now at MyFaithRadio.com. Please subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any episodes and then share it with friends so together we can all have a deeper life in Christ.